right, let's get started. So, um, so last time I said that uh, um, let's see. Uh, last time we said uh, that if um, if a category C uh, has limits. For all functors, functors uh, from J into C for C a, uh, for J a small category, uh, then um, lim was a right adjoint functor to diagonal, uh, where say lim goes from functors from J to C. C and so delta goes the other other way around. Um, now, Sorry, is lim, just the that the lim is a functor that that takes the limit of this thing. So the point is that it's only a functor if all functors out of here actually have a limit. Otherwise, it's not a well-defined functor. Um, all right. So an important uh, thing that we care about is when. The category has all small limits or all small co-limits. Um, so I don't know if I've I've written this up before. Uh, C is um, complete if it has all small limits, and a small limit is. Um, so that's to say that for all functors into C from a small category, all of those functors have limits. That's what, that's what we're saying. Um, C is co-complete. Uh, and you might argue that this should actually be complete um, if it has all small co-limits. Same thing, we look at Functors into C from small categories. If all of those have co-limits, uh, then it's co-complete. <coughs> okay, but that seems like, uh, and I guess we say, sorry, that's what I was saying. It's 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 a a small limit is a limit out of a small category. So the functor is from yeah. Okay, so it's bi-complete if both. All right, but this is obviously not a thing that you want to check directly, because then you have to check every functor out of every small category. And there are too many small categories. Um, all right, so let's, let's uh, have something that you should probably call a theorem. Uh, if the category C has all products, let's say finite products, products, and equalizes um, then it has well, actually, let's say we just introduced some a definition, so I might as well use it. Then C is uh, complete. All right. So actually, checking completeness is is much less of a of a of, is much less difficult than it seems at first. Here, it's like, oh, we have to check every small limit, but no, actually, we just have to check that. For any finite product, it exists, and for any equalizer, it exists. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that at the end. Yeah. It, it, it actually is going to be an exercise. Yes. All right. All right. So, what? How are we gonna do this? Well, I guess that we should start by with some functor. So, 
let uh, f be a functor from j to c for j a small category. All right. Then, then uh, the limit of f is constructed as follows. All right. So we're going to take a diagram. So first, we're going to take the product. So we have, um, finite. Hmm. Okay. No, I'm going to have to take the word finite out of here. So we're going to say all products, not just finite products. All right, so I'm going to take the product of all objects, over all objects j and j, so indexed by the, so the objects of j form a set, and so we can index a product over them. Uh, and it's going to be the image of j under the functor that we started with. All right, now I'm going to take another product. But this time, I'm going to take it over all maps in J. Uh, and I'm going to take, so for a get the, the component indexed by a given map is going to be the image of the codomain. Under the, under the thing. All right. Uh, this is a product. That means we have. <coughs> that means we have projection maps. Um, to the components, so this projects to F K, uh, and these are there's one of these for each um, F. Uh, and I'm going to just draw this on both sides, but it's the same map on both sides. All right. Uh, so for each of each each object in here, we have an object. We have a map from here to here. Uh, for each sort of, um, well, this comes with a projection map, right? Uh, and how do I want to say this? These are, I'm going to, so I guess I'll call this PJ. Um, Right, so no, this map isn't. This map is, for each component of this, um, for every, for every, for every, for, okay, so for everything in here, right, I have, an, I have an FK corresponding here. And because this is a product over them, I have a projection map up to it. Um, which means that for each, each of the FJs, I have a projection map to something up here. Um, there's always a map here with the codomain that's K, that's J. Yes. I, this is for every map in J, which means the identities are in here. Right? And this is over every object in J. So I always, like, I have a map to every single one of these from this that's the projection map. Right? 
every every single one of these is an FJ. No. It's explicitly not the point. The point is we're going to do that for the other map. I mean, yeah, but I mean, that's all of the possible, that's over all of the possible J. Yes. What if there's a J that maps, that doesn't have a map into some other, like, FK, then how do you predict on You don't need one. The, this, this is a product, so it has a map to every, every FJ. That's equipped, that's what it means to be a product over those things. Yeah. And so you don't need to have like from you don't have you just need the fact that for every every one of these, something in here projects onto the domain. The codomain, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, because we have maps to every because we have a map from here to every um, thing that this is a product over, we get a map here by the universal property of products, by the universal property of this product. So I'm going to call this phi. All right, and now we also have these projection maps like this. So you yes. are you multiplying the same element multiple times? Could it be when you take the product of both? Uh, I mean, there will be multiple yeah. copies. There, there will be like more things here yeah. than there are here. But it doesn't matter. The point, like, if I have two copies of, say, FJ in here, I get a map from FJ here. I get a map from this to each of those copies. It's the same map. All right. OK, so I have this projection map here to all the, to all the Js, and then I can apply FK, uh, FF. And that's another map, a different map, to the components of this thing. And so I get this here. But again, by the universal property of this product, because I have something mapping to all of the product components. All right. So now I can ask for an equalizer. So these are, this is, these are two maps going from this product to this product. So I'm going to put E here, and it comes with a map gamma. So E is the equalizer of, um, let's see, I'll do it like this. Maybe I won't. Is the, is the equalizer of uh, phi and psi. All right, so it, it's, the, it's the universal object and map, which is gamma, so that, let's make sure I get this order right. Um, uh, so, so, uh, phi gamma equals psi gamma. All right. Um, so the important thing here is that we could construct these these products because uh, we're in a because this category has all products and because j is small. OK, so if we take, so given, um, OK, so we have given some map f from j to k uh, in the category j, we have the following. So, oh, sorry, and I wanted to do one last thing. Um, so because I have a map into this product, that's the same thing as having a map into each of its components. So I have a map into fj uh, from E, which I'm going to call delta j, 
uh, so that the projections onto J commute with, maybe I should make the J bigger, so that this triangle commutes, right? This is a product. A map into it is the same thing as a map into each of its components, so that the, the map into it and followed by the projections commute. Where? Okay, so to 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 describe a map into this product, I need to describe a map from here into each of its components. This is one way of doing that, and so that gets me the top map. This is a different way of doing that, and that gets me the bottom map. Um, and because I have two maps going from something to something else, and I'm in a category with equalizers, I can take the equalizer of those two maps. <coughs> all right. So that's all the diagram I need for now. So given some map in our source category J, uh, I've got that, uh, OK, so delta J is this map. Um, it commutes with this, so that's uh, equal to pj gamma. Uh, pj gamma, well, pj is actually the same thing as commutes with this. So um, pj gamma equals pf phi gamma. Awful phi. Um, phi gamma. All right. Now I use the fact that this is an equal, the gamma is part of an equalizer, so I can swap these two around. So I get that PF is equal to, so, is, so this is equal to PF uh, psi gamma. Yep. Uh, and then psi, uh, pf psi is determined by this, these things. And so this is now, um, so we get ff, so ff pj gamma, ff pj gamma. Uh, but pj gamma, is is this? Uh, wait, what have I done? Uh, P J P J. Oh, uh, I think that I wanted to start with. One of these should have a K somewhere. I think I either I should have started with a K or I should have ended up with a K. I can't remember. Um, sorry, I did this pretty late uh, last night. Um, so you can replace PJ gamma with delta J, right? Right, so actually this should be K. This should be K. So that's how I get PF, because it should be the, because because this projection corresponds to the code on the codomain. <coughs> so actually, maybe it's, it's, it's better that I write PK here. And actually, now that makes a lot more sense. Um, OK. So and then, and now this is, um, no. No, no, because they, they correspond to 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 those things. All right. So the point is that I have one of these for each of each of these, and so I ha actually have like way more copies of K than I. Yeah. Okay. No, these are two separate maps. I'm doing. So this is this way. This is this way. This is here, here, here. Yeah, yeah, it's composition. Um, gamma doesn't make sense. Just put subscript here. All right, and then so let's see, ff pj gamma, but then pj gamma 
was delta j, and so this is ff delta j. So what have I shown? I've shown that um, I've shown that uh, I have e, I have um, Do this the wrong way. Uh, I have, yeah, this is right. I have fj, I have fk, I have delta k, I have delta j, and I have ff. So I've shown that this commutes. So in particular, what I've shown is that E together with these delta maps is a cone uh, over f. Because this holds for all objects j and k and all maps f from j to k in j. So I've built a cone. So we're almost having a limit. We just need to show that it's universal. Uh, so if we have some other cone, say a with um, cone maps alpha j, uh, cone over f, uh, we get a map from A into this product. Uh, so we get a map into this product. Um, I'm going to call this beta. All right, uh, by the universal property of the product. So what's the point here? The point is that if, if, it like, if this is a cone over f, then these are maps from a into the fj's. And so we have a map into each of these from a. And so by the universal property of the product, we have a map from a into this product. Um, so it's a cone. As it's a cone, we kind of run this thing backwards now. So we started off knowing that this was an equalizer, and then we showed that it was a cone. Now I'm going to say, well, this is a cone, and then show that it equalizes these two maps. Uh, so it's a cone, so f of f. Uh, Pj beta. So now I'm now 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 think about replacing this diagram with with a um, with with a here and beta here. Uh, this is ff of alpha j, right? Because that's the the projection and the map into the product is the same thing as the as the the maps to the components. Um, OK, now this is alpha k. This bit follows because this is a cone. This is the property of being a cone. Uh, then this is pk of beta, again, because that's, um, because, because this is a, a map in a cone, uh, a map to one of the, um, to co the components, and this is the corresponding commuting triangle. Um, so uh, phi beta equals psi beta. Uh, so by the universal property of an equalizer, uh, there exists a unique map from A to E. Um, that is a map of cones. Um, and uh, you should verify this, that it is a map of cones, um, if, you're un if you're concerned. But uh, it's sort of, 
uh, the map from A to E from A to this product factors through E, and then I'm saying that the um, because those are because those are all maps into a product, you sort of need to show that the thing the triangles commute, but they do, and you can check that. All right, so exercise. Dualize. This is a good thing to practice dualizing on because it's got a lot of moving parts. You have you need to turn your products into your products into coproducts, your equalizers into co-equalizers. Um, you need to flip this diagram. Like there's a lot going on here, and so checking each thing is sort of individually trivial, but as a whole, it's non-trivial. So I, I so suppose. Uh, C has all coproducts, coproducts, uh, and e coequalizers. Uh, show C is co-complete. It's a very good exercise. Uh, I recommend you do it. Uh, and so the, so the upshot is that to check if a category is complete or co-complete, you really only need to check that it has products and, and equalizers, uh, or co-products and co-equalizers. OK. Uh, let's move on. Yes. <laughs> um, so my understanding is that this result can be extended by doing something with like set theoretic universes. Uh, I don't care enough to think about. Um, all right, so last time. I said, Rappel, write adjoints preserve. Oh, fuck, this is awful. <laughs> uh, write adjoints preserve limits. And Julie left adjoints preserve co-limits, but cap is less is is less memorable than rappel. Um, all right, so we're going to show this in the nice case where the categories are bicomplete. Um, this holds in more generality. Uh, but the, the, the proof for the bicomplete case is nice and clean. Um, so suppose, suppose we have functors f and g between c and d, uh, such that f is left adjoint to g. <coughs> and uh, c and d are bicomplete. Uh, let H be a functor from J into D for J small. Oh, do I need J small? Mm, yeah. Uh, I need J small because because of I guess, yeah, I'm only trying to prove things about small limits. All right. Uh, OK. This is just going to be a sequence of isomorphisms. Uh, so maps in the category C from an object x to 
g applied to the limit of j of h. OK. So h is a functor from j to d. Its limit is then an object in d. And so we apply g to that, and we get an object in c. All right, this is the same thing as maps in d from fx to the limit of h. All right, so this is, this is because f is left to join to g. And then this is uh, the same thing as natural transformations between functors from um, j into d between, all right, the delta functor uh, fx, so I might do this this way, and h. And this is because uh, delta is left to join to limb, which we have because uh, d is bicomplete, so it's complete, so it has all small limits, and j is small. So this is an adjoint pair, as we showed last time. Yes? So could you just remind me what the delta functor is? The delta functor. The, I'll do it here. The delta functor goes from, uh, let's see, in this case, d to dj, and it sends an object x to um, the functor delta x from delta x, which is from d to j, uh, from j to d, sends an object j to x and a map to the identity on x. All right. So next we have, OK, now it gets a bit more annoying. Next we have that delta and f commute. So now we have f applied to delta x to h. All right, so what's happening at this point All right, delta fx is a functor from j to d which sends j to fx and a map in j to the identity on fx. f delta x is a functor from j to d. And let's see, it, you take this functor on x, so it sends everything in. Wait, uh, right, so this is actually, so this, this delta x that I flipped with, this is, this is actually a functor um, from um, J into C now. OK? So what I did here was I took some object in D that was determined by an object in C, because X is in C, uh, and applied this. And so that gets me a functor as described over there. But when I flip these two, I'm composing this functor with this functor. So I get a functor from j to c, and then do f, which goes from c to d. 
Uh, so this is delta x, and then I apply f, and I go from c to d. All right, but delta, delta x takes j to x. It takes everything in j to x and the identity on x. So when we apply f to that, it takes everything to fx and the identity on fx. So this functor sends j to fx and f to the identity on fx. So these are the same functor. All right, these, are the, these two are the same functors from j to d, and so the natural transformations are the same because, because it's just a different name for the same functor. All right. Uh, OK. Then we have that maps from, uh, so natural transformations of functors from j into c. This is, so these are the same as, now I can do delta x um, gh. All right, so if we be kind of lazy, <coughs> this is because f is left adjoined to g. Um, but that's kind of cheating here, because uh, that says something about maps between like sets of these types, not ones that are between like functor categories. So we have to say something about that here. And, and it's still, it follows from that, but it's just not, not so immediate. All right. So if we have some natural transformation in this set, that's a map from, there's a natural transformation alpha from f delta x to h. Uh, the components are alpha j from fx to hj. All right, uh, then we can take um, alpha j bar to cross to, to go across the adjoint because now this is something in maps from uh, now this now this is something in like c from f of x to hj, and this is in bijection with uh, d of x of g of hj. So this, this now is following from, uh, from the adjointness. Sorry. Oh, thank you. OK. Uh, so now I can take the adjoint map, which we called bar before. So that's from x to g h of j. Uh, and this, uh, this is components of a natural transformation, which I'll call alpha bar, uh, which goes from x to, oh, no, this is a natural transformation. I want this to go from uh, delta x to gh. All right, so. Um, uh, we can construct another natural, we can, given a natural transformation here, we can construct one here the same way. Um, and those two ways of constructing them are bijection, like they're mutually inverse. And so this is a bijection. Um, uh, and I'm not going to say anything about naturality. These things are natural. You can check that. Um, all right. And then the last bijection is that C x lim g h. Uh, and 
this last one, again, follows from the delta adjoint to limb. Uh, but now we're doing it in C instead of in D, where we used it before. OK. So this is the proof that right adjoints preserve limits. Um, well, this is a proof. Uh, what are we doing for time? OK. Um, I think I will switch back to this side. Uh, OK, so that sort of finishes off from last time. Now we're going to start talking about algebraic structure and encoding algebraic structure with category theory. Encoding and generalizing. Yes. Yes. That means that they're isomorphic. Yeah. Wait, that means that um, that, that means lib G H and H lib G lib H. Th that means that these two are isomorphic objects. So the, the G applied to this limit is the same thing as the limit of G composed with H. So that's saying that that's saying that G preserves limits because it it it. It takes a funct like. Wait, so the maps having the maps into the things. Yeah, this was this was one of the things we proved on like, the first day I think, or the second day. This is yeah, this is um, this is this is one of the first things that that you cover in category theory is that two objects are isomorphic if and only if maps into them from all other objects in the category are in bijection. Uh, and also, f same with maps out of them. And that's, it's actually pretty easy to check. Um, all right. So, <coughs> all right. Right, I mean, if you want to do co limits, adjoints, preserve limits, you should do the dual thing. And that's a good exercise, yes. No, I think. Oh, no, you only need to show it in one direction. You don't, you don't need to show both of them, they're equivalent. All right, so now we're going to have a lot of definitions. Um, all right, so a monoidal category. is a sextuple C tensor 1 lambda rho alpha. OK, so what are all these things? C is a category. Uh, tensor. So monoidal categories are also called tensor categories. This is a bit confusing because some people use the term tensor category to mean monoidal category with a load of extra structure on top of it. And some people use tensor category just to mean the same thing as monoidal category. Sorry? Yes, I did. Uh, some of it, yeah. It was good. It was, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of equivariant stable homotopy theory in it, which was nice. It was Viglik always uh, false. Um, all right. So, uh, and it was a colloquium talk, so it was pitched at the right level, which is which is good because people often pitch colloquium talks way too high. All right. So we have uh, tensor is a is a functor. From C cross C into C. Um, so this is a 
defunct. Uh. <coughs> um, uh, one is just an object in the category. Lambda is a natural transformation from one tensor blank to the identity on C. Rho is a natural trans and sorry, a natural isomorph. These are both natural isomorphisms from blank tensor one to the identity on C. And alpha is a natural transformation from blank tensor blank tensor blank to blank tensor blank tensor blank. And this is a functor from C cross C cross C to C. All right, so what are these things? Uh, we call this, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to say that in a sec. So this is a, uh, we haven't talked about product categories. Um, the objects are pairs of objects. Uh, the maps are pairs of maps between the relevant components. Um, it's, what, it's what you think it should be. Um, all right, so one is a unit object. Object. Uh, so these, these, all three of these are natural, is, uh, 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 natural isomorphisms. So these are yeah. uh, natural isos. This lambda is called the left unitor. Rho is called the right unitor. And alpha is called the associator. All right, and they all encode things that, that their, name, their names should be suggestive of. All right. Um, I want to say that this natural transformation from natural isomorphism from here to here is not enough for associativity. Because it's an, these are isomorphisms and not equalities, this is the statement that, that of three objects being isomorphic like this is not enough. You need more. I'm not going to justify why, what, why you need what, we're about to, what I'm about to write up, but you need to satisfy these conditions. So uh, satisfying coherence conditions. And these are the following. So this is a lot. Uh, we're going to start with w tensor x, tensor y, tensor z. And now we kind of want to get to all the different ways of parenthesizing this. So w <coughs> tensor y, tensor z. Oh, sorry, this should be x, and this should be y, and then we tensor by z. And then here we want w tensor x tensor y tensor z. And then we want w tensor x tensor y tensor z. And then we want w tensor x, tensor y, tensor z. OK, these are the five ways of parenthesizing four things. Uh, so the map here is going to be uh, the associator of w, x, y tensored with. So the components here have, well, the objects are in, in C cross C cross C. So you have to, to specify a component. You have to specify three objects in C. Uh, and this is tensored with the identity on Z. Then going down this way, we have the associator of W, 
x tensor y, which is an object in C, and z. And here we have the associator of w tensor x, y, and z. Here we have the associator of w, x, and y tensor z. And going this way, we have the identity on w tensor, the associator of x, y, and z. All right, so we want this diagram to commute. Uh, so this, so what I was saying was that having this natural isomorphism is not enough to have associativity. But if you have this diagram commuting, then you have associativity. Um, and I'm not going to justify that. Uh, but it's a non-trivial amount of work to show that if you have associativity on four elements like this with isomorphisms, then you have associativity for all, for all, all things. All right. So we might call this the associativity pentagon. Uh, I've heard it called the pentagon axiom. Uh, oh, we're still a, a fair way off that. Um, OK, so we have x tensor 1 tensor y. Uh, and then we have x tensor 1 tensor y. All right, we have the associator x 1 y. So I, I, hopefully it's clear that I want this to hold for all choices of w, x, y, and z. And similarly here, I want this told for all choices of x and y in the category. And then we have x tensor y, where this is the left unitor for x tensored with the identity on y. And this is the identity on x tensored with the right unitor on y. All right, and I want this to commute. Um, OK, this is the information of a monoidal category. I am not done with definitions, not by a long way. <coughs> um, well, you, so what the, the unit is a specific object. Like, you have to pick an object. Um, Uh, I think if you have the rest of the structure the same, if you pick a different object, it will be um, isomorphic. And there's probably a good notion of equivalence. But there is a good notion of equivalence between monodal categories. And you'll find that those monodal categories are equivalent. So yeah. Um, so it, it shouldn't really matter. Um, all right. So a monoidal category. Also, we're going to be drawing like a lot of diagrams like this for the rest of this. Uh, a monoidal category is braided uh, if it is equipped with uh, a natural isomorphism, which I'll call gamma. And I'll write the components as gamma x, y, going from x tensor y to y tensor x. All right. And we call this the braiding. I should also say that there's a, there's, a, there's a diagrammatic calculus that exists for um, like tensor categories uh, called string diagrams. I don't understand them, so I'm not going to talk about them. Um, all right, 
So we have a monoidal category, so the, this sextuple plus this braiding, and we wanted to satisfy <coughs> some conditions. Again, some, some coherence conditions. So this is kind of annoying. I have two hexagons, so x, y, z, and then I want x, uh, x, y, z, and z tensor. Y tensor Z tensor X, Y tensor Z tensor X, and Y tensor X tensor Z, and Y tensor X tensor Z. These all look different. Yeah, OK. This maybe isn't so clear. <coughs> right, so I didn't write that up deliberately. It's between functors. Uh, this, is, this, is, this, is between, this is between a functor that takes in. Um, the, the, so these, these are both functors from C cross C into C. One of them takes x, y to x tensor y, and the other one takes x, y to y tensor x. Like it's, um, yeah, 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 that's why, that's why I wrote it by its components, because it's kind of a pain to write out what it is on functors. Um, particularly if, I'm tr if I wanted to try and write it this way, because then it's, <laughs> then it's very misleading. All right, so here, we have the associator. I'm going to start dropping the subscripts because it's a lot of extra things that should be hopefully clear from um, context what the subscripts and various subscripts should be. All right, this should be y tensor z tensor x. All right. So here we have the braiding, and we're braiding uh, x past y tensor z. So these, that, that's where the swap is. Um, and then here we do the associator again. So we move these brackets up, or parentheses up. All right, then down the bottom, we're braiding x past y, and we're doing the identity on z. And then here we're doing the associator. And then here we are, let's see, we're braiding x past z. So this is the identity on y tense of the braiding. All right. So that, so I want this to commute. Um, fuck, I have another hexagon. I think I am just going to write it out just so the whole thing is up. Um, Um, so this is a, these sorts of coherence diagrams um, show up in higher category theory and other reason, uh, one of the main reasons that higher category theory is very difficult. Is coherence always true with associative theory? Um, or why is it true? I... Don't have a good answer for that. Yeah, I would say that's what that's 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 the problem here is is associativity. Um, okay, so we want. Uh, so here we have associativity, but we're pushing the 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 parentheses back. So we'll say the inverse of associativity. Here we have braiding. Again, we're shifting x tensor y past z. Uh, and then here we have, again, associativity inverse because we're pushing the parentheses back. All right, and then here we have 
the identity on x tends to the braiding, so we're braiding y past z. Um, and then here we have, again, the inverse of the associator because we're pushing the parentheses back. And then here we have uh, the braiding tensor because we're braiding x past z tensor the identity on y. All right. So now, all of this is the information of a braided monoidal category. Um, there are a lot of coherence diagrams, and they get very big, very non-planar, um, and they get they get massive quickly. Like it's a it's a serious enterprise to figure out what such things should be. Um, all right. Very very quickly, um, and I mean. Arguably, you could fit anything onto a page. It's just whether or not it's usefully fit onto a page, right? Like I said, it's, it quickly becomes non-planar, and so it becomes very, it would be very hard to read anything on a page. Um, I don't know. Sorry, uh, not yet, but thank you. Um, a symmetric monodal category Uh, is a braided monoidal category um, satisfying the following condition. All right. So if I braid an object past the one object, the unit object, um, I want that to agree with the left and right unitors. Okay? And if I braid an object past another object and then I braid them back, I want that to be the identity. So it's not always the case that in a braided category that if you like, this is always going to be an isomorphism, but it's not necessarily the identity isomorphism. <coughs> OK. Um, so I wanted to put all these definitions up, but I'm not going to talk too much about them. Um, I'm going to talk about examples of monodal categories, and most of my examples are going to be symmetric monodal categories. Um, but I'm not going to sort of spend a lot of time pointing that out. Uh, and as you can see, there's like a lot to check. Uh, so I'm not going to be checking any of these things carefully here. This is another sort of thing you should do in the privacy of your own home. Um, all right. Um, there might be. I'm not aware of, of it, but um, it's, not, it's not strongly my area. But like, it's usually the sort of thing that, like, if it's an important category, someone's written a paper about it, and then people just are like, well, it's true. <coughs> All right, let's see some examples. First, uh, we have a symmetric monodal category given by set, Cartesian product of sets, which is product of sets, categorical product. Uh, the unit element is uh, the single is a singleton set, uh, and The structure things are all identities. Um, yeah, the structure and natural transformations are all identities. Actually, maybe it's a mis 
It's okay. It's a bit misleading to write IDC on that, but they're all identities. So I'll just write ID. ID, ID, ID. All right. Uh, so we should note this is the terminal object in the category of sets, the singleton set. Um, I'm like maybe sliding some stuff under the rug by saying the identity uh, because we're probably choosing something in like an isomorphism class for every sort of product so that our like product of x, our product of the product of x and y with z is not a pair that consists of a pair of elements from x and y and an element z. We're saying it's just a triple of elements x, y, z. Um, all right. So let's start by noting that like, if we have some map uh, from A into X, say F, then if I put the terminal object here, so the singleton set, I have a map to that from A because it's terminal. I have a map to that from X because it's terminal. Uh, and I can put the identity here. And I can put F here. And this commutes on both sides. And so the product of x with a singleton is x itself. Uh, so I'm the Cartesian product of a set with a singleton is the set, right? Um, yeah, what was I saying? Yeah, I guess I'm saying something about the, the, unit, the unit conditions. All right. Uh, so I wanted to say that um, that x cross y cross. This is actually something I probably should have done at some other point, but there are lots of things that I should have done that I haven't sort of had time to. Um, we'll say that these these things are the same up to unique isomorphism. Um, up to ISO. And how do we see this? Well, I'm going to take x tensor y tensor z. And then I have x, x cross y, y, y cross z, and z. x cross y comes equipped with maps into x and y. y cross z comes equipped with maps into y and z. X cross Y cross Z comes equipped with a map into X cross Y and a map into Z. Right. So I guess I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is um, what I was just saying about how it doesn't matter whether, like, I can just write X cross Y cross Z and that's a thing. Um, Um, it shows that two things satisfy the same universal property. Um, it's it's stronger than saying they that they that they look the same. It's saying that they there's only one way in which they look the same. All right. So from these maps, which I'll call one, which I'll which I'll say is the first thing that happens. Uh, I don't know. From from this sorry. Isn't it possible for an object not just to be unique if it wants to kill it? Yeah, it is. Um, all right. So, uh, but not not via universal property. Okay. It involves it involves other maps around it. It's not just it's not it's not just any uh, yeah. All right. So I have this map from here into this product, but that means that I have a map that's the composition into both of these things. Yeah. 
All right, but then from these two maps, this map and this map, I have a map from here into here by the universal property of this product. All right, now if I take x cross y cross z, this comes equipped with a map into here and a map into here. So, let's see, it's green. So, because I have a map into here and a map into here, uh, and I have the same maps from up here, these, these two maps give me a map from here to here. And then I can do the same thing down here x cross y, y, y cross z, z. OK, now this came with a map here and a map here. Uh, doing the same thing. From this map, I get maps here. From uh, from these two maps, I get a map here. This came with a map to here, or you can think about that the equalities down here, and a map to here. So now I have a map from here to here, and a map from here to from wait a map from here to here and a map from here to here. And so I get a map going back. And this is sort of the same thing we did showing that, um, that the, the, the product of two things was, was unique up to unique isomorphism. You can stack these, and this has to be the identity, and it has to be the identity in the other direction. And so they're unique, and they're unique up to unique isomorphism. Yeah, we're, 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 we're um, repeating the universal property of products so just over and over again until we have shown this. OK. Uh, so we could do a similar trick to show. So this is, this is products of three things. Great. Uh, but if we wanted to show that the Pentagon holds, we could do the same trick with products of four things, but we would have to do it like, I don't know, 25 times or something, or half that. You can't have half 25. I don't know. You'd have to do it some combinatorial number of times. That's like a non-trivial amount of work. But you could do it, and it would hold. Um, OK. Uh, the braiding. is from x cross y to y cross x, and is what you think it is. You take x comma y, and you send it to y comma x. Great. All right. So this is an example of a, of a symmetric mineral category. Uh, and in fact, uh, any category with all finite, this is why I had finite products on the brain earlier at the very start. So with all finite products, uh, can be regarded a, let's see, a monoidal category Uh, with product as tensor and the terminal object as the unit object or the identity object. What do I call it? Unit object. Okay, as the unit object. <coughs> So um, a mineral category formed this way is called a Cartesian monoidal category. 
Um, an example of this is the category of small categories. Um, yes, so the terminal object exists because it's the empty product. Um, all right. Uh, similarly, any cat category with all finite coproducts. Oof. Sorry. I, I don't know what you mean by categorical. Oh, what is a unit object here? It's the it's one. It's the category with one object and the identity morphism and no other morphisms. Sorry. No. And in fact, we will see that any category with all finite coproducts. Uh, is a monoidal category with, uh, so coproduct as tensor and the initial object as unit. Okay, so this uh, includes, say, um, vector spaces over some field uh, with, um, so actually people often just, so I said a monodal category is a sex tuple and it is, but people often just write a monodal category as a triple and sort of leave the natural isomorphisms implicit um, because, I don't know, mathematicians are like that. Uh, so the tensor is direct sum or coproduct. Um, and the unit object is the zero vector space. Uh, we also have abelian groups, uh, and this is the same. Um, and in fact, these, these two are really just examples of, of um, R mod, so R modules with direct sum and the zero, the trivial module as, as a unit. Um, okay, let's. No. Wait. Uh, yes, this is pointed. Uh, yes, these are all pointed categories. No, no. In the category of in the category of sets, the initial object is the empty set, and the terminal object is the singleton. Does that mean finite coproducts? It has finite coproducts and finite products, and then yes, you, it has two different. There are two different mineral structures on the category set. I believe no, no, they they are not the same mineral structure. No, no, they're two different. They're two different. If you if you take set with this monodal structure, it's different from the monodal structure with um, disjoint union and empty set. They're different monodal structures. Okay, I'm gonna erase this stuff about rating for more examples, and maybe for a more interesting example now. Which is good, because it's one of my favorite categories. I don't get to talk about it that often. So we have previously spoken about tangles. So on objects, so recall that the objects of, tang the, objects of the category of tangles is just natural numbers. On objects, we need to say what m tensor n is, and it's going to be m plus n. 
And then we need to say what tensor does on morphisms. And we recall that a morphism between, say, 2 and 4 is a diagram up to ambient isotopy, whatever that means. But it means like pulling strings around and not pushing them over each other. Um, is a diagram of this form. And so we might want to tensor that with, a, say, a map from 3 to 1. And that's going to be a diagram like this. Uh, let's see. Ooh, I made this one fancy. Uh, this is going to go like this. It's going to go here. Circle here. All right, so I want to say what tensoring these two is. And this is going to be, OK, well, I have to add the numbers here. So on the top, I should have five dots. And on the bottom, I should also have five dots. Everyone is happy that 2 plus 3 is 5 and 4 plus 1 is 5? Yes, good. OK. Don't worry, I also struggle with arithmetic. Um, all right. And it's literally just put these diagrams together. So this is going to look like this. Uh, and 0 is 0 is the, maybe I'll make this not look so much like a 0. Yeah. Yes, this is an unknot. So it is also the same thing as having a 0 here. So in fact, I could say that this, this, this tensor thing is, is, say, this. Because these two are the same up to ambient isotopy. All right. And 0, which is a natural number, is uh, the unit object. All right. So that's a more interesting example of a, of a monoidal category. Um, Maybe I'll put a couple more down here. So uh, like I said, we call these tensor categories. So maybe we should expect that some categories with some notion of tensoring has them. Uh, so we can have the category of vector spaces, uh, again, uh, with tensoring over the field um, and the ground field itself as unit. Uh, we can have representations of some group G. Uh, and there's a notion of tensoring group representations. And the um, and there's a trivial representation on the on the ground field. Um, and that acts as a unit with respect to this. So that's another example of a monoidal, monoidal category. Um, Viglik doesn't know representation theory. I mean, v, Viglik doesn't know representation theory in the same way that he doesn't know differential geometry, but someone had a problem with it, with it and came and asked him about it, and then he worked it out on the board. Um, Viglik's, Viglik's bar for not knowing something is, is, is very high. <laughs> All right, so six. Uh, so. In a good category of topological spaces, say 
uh, compactly generated weak Hausdorff, which I'm going to call like curly T. Um, we have the smat. We have the following as a symmetric monodal category. We have T. So it's this category. The tensor is smash product, and the unit is the zero sphere. So uh, the smash product of two topological spaces is you take their category, their their product, and you. Um, oh, so I should say pointed, pointed topological spaces. So they have base point. You take their product, and then you quotient by the product of x with the base point in y, and the product of y uh, of the base point in x with y. So we've seen an example of this. Uh, Note that last time, I think last time, we saw the reduced suspension of a yeah, last time, or the time before. Recently, we saw the reduced suspension of a space. Uh, and in, in fact, this is the same thing as um, x smashed with the, the circle, or s1. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you suspend n times, so you just keep applying this this suspension functor tensor with S1, um, this is homeomorphic to X smash Sn. <coughs> uh, yeah, so you take the product of two things, and then you like collapse the copy of each associated with the base point of the other. I'm not going to explain that. Um, so I'm not going to explain what I mean by compactly generated weak Hausdorff. Uh, the point is that the, the, category, the category of topological spaces is really, like, it would be a worthwhile thing to explain if this wasn't a category theory course. Um, the category of topological spaces sucks. It's like just full of pathologies. None of the things you want to be true are true. Um, in particular, the following thing is not true. So, although actually we'll get to that in a bit. But uh, first, the definition. So, a monodal category is closed if for all objects x in C, so my monodal category is C, um, the functor blank tensor x, so that goes from C to itself, has a right adjoint. Uh, which we're going to call square brackets x blank, also going from C to C. Um, and you might call this internal HOM for, for, for good reasons um, that I'm not going to go into now. OK, so if we have such, an, such, a, um, such a right adjoint, uh, that tells us that maps from A tensor x to B are the same thing as maps from x uh, from a to internal hom x b. This is currying again. So the point is that a closed a closed monodal category is one that sort of lets you do currying against the tensor product. Um, we like currying. It is a useful thing to have. Uh, so let's see some examples of this. <coughs> so.
So, examples. All right. In the first, the first example that we did, uh, so set Cartesian product and singleton. Um, uh, so what are we looking for? We're looking for an adjoint to taking the Cartesian product with x. Um, and this is adjoint to uh, I write this, uh, set x blank. And in fact, we've already seen this. We've, we've, we've seen this version of the tensor homo junction. So the internal hom xb is the set of map of functions from x to b. OK. Now let's see a non-example. This is a fun one. So uh, one of our, one of our uh, examples of uh, an example of a monoidal category is a category of rings, which we can tensor over z, uh, and the unit object is z itself. Suppose that this tensor thing did have a right adjoint for all rings. <coughs> then, if we take the map, the the set of maps, ring maps, ring homomorphisms from R to S. Well, this is isomorphic to ring um, homomorphisms from Z tensor Z R to S, because Z is a unit with respect to this tensor. Uh, but now we can use our adjoint, and so we have a set of maps from Z to the internal HOM from R to S, which is going to be some ring. Uh, this is a true. This is just a true thing about rings. Tensoring, tensoring with Z gives you back the ring. They're isomorphic as rings. Um, that's that's <coughs> all right. So, but this is a singleton because there is one. There's a, there's only one ring homomorphism from Z to any other ring. But then I'm saying that between any two rings is precisely one ring homomorphism. So actually, I'm saying that every ring is isomorphic to every other ring. Um, but this is, a, this is just a false thing. Um, so no internal hom. All right. Let's see another non-example. Uh, that I'm doing because I want to turn it into an example. So um, I guess I'm not going to exhibit the thing that I'm going to say, but it's, it, it leans into some stuff we've done already. So if we consider the category of <coughs> topological spaces uh, also with, with product as the tensor and Terminal object as <coughs> terminal object as the unit, uh, so that's just the the space with one point. If there's only one topology on that, all right. Uh, the thing here is well, blank cross x from top to top. doesn't commute with co-limits for all topological
topological spaces, probably even for most of them. But the point is that there are some topological spaces for which this functor doesn't commute with co-limits, so it can't be a left adjoint. So this is annoying, because we like currying. But we can't do it in the category of topological spaces. That's so shitty. Um, so with regard to this not commuting with co-limits, <coughs> Um, at the level of sets, it does. So if you take the topological spaces, the map that you end up with between sort of um, between sort of the two things when you're flipping the co-limits from one place to another, um, what you get is an identity on elements of this thing as a set, but they have different topologies. And the map that you end up with is not a homeomorphism. Um, and the point is, I only need to exhibit that for like, for like one particular co-limit and one particular um, thing. And I, I've seen an example, but it's like really annoying. Um, and so I'm not going to go into it here. Um, so the reason that we want um, this good category is to ensure that uh, the thing that we end up with has, has currying with respect to what a Barrymore neural structure is. So um, no, I don't think so. I think, I think we, still, we still we still need to deal with the underlying topology problems before we pass the spectra. I, th I, think, I think you'll still have problems with. I, I don't think it does. No. Viglik promised you. I, I said nothing. All right. So, examples. Uh, so, now I'm going to take this, this T thing that I said. Uh, so actually here, I might put a star here to say that this is pointed, compactly generated, weak Hausdorff spaces. And so now, now I can use the product and the terminal topological space. Um, and now I get some version of internal HOM. So this, this does have, uh, this does have um, a right adjoint when you rule out the pathologies that sort of stop you from doing it. Um, and similarly, we have for pointed, compactly generated weak Hausdorff spaces, we can take smash and S not. OK. Uh, what time is it? Oof. Let's take a five minute break. Um,